before we start with the very exciting panel and uh, discussion, I do want to recognize and thank uh, Seagate Structure USA for sponsoring yeah, the session. And with that, our first speaker, um, Peter Moon, frankly doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I will anyway. Uh, Peter Moon, uh, who is the National Sustainability Manager for the Canadian Wood Council. So Peter, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> is this okay? Can you hear me? Um, <coughs> Carbon destruction and COP21 trends and opportunities for wood use. It's actually a pretty boring title. Um, but I want to ask a question. How many of you are architects? Okay. Engineers? Researchers or PhDs? Any marine biologists? <laughs> Thank you. So, an alternate title for this could be what a marine biologist thinks we all need to know about carbon, whether we like it or not. So, I'm going to cover a, a few things. Forest and wood, sink, sequester, substitute, that uh, common phrase that, that in the wood industry. Carbon commitments and regulations, a little bit on time, because time is important. Uh, LCA, is it an environmental damage assessment or a design tool? And some high performance buildings. This isn't working here. Can you start? So we're all aware of some critical issues around, around climate change. Now, I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm not going to get into the, the science of that. But I think there's a whole bunch of issues which are both opportunities and impacts mm -hmm. that, that affect, affect the wood industry. Um, and generally, we're trying to be able to make our buildings uh, and our environment a little bit better for, for the future. So this, is, uh, this shows the ups and downs of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, at Mauna Loa. Um, and I said I'm not a climate scientist, but I do, one of the things that I do uh, I try to advance is that if we have a way to reduce dumping crap into the atmosphere that we wouldn't put there normally, whether it's CO2 or sulfur or nitrous, I don't really care what. But if we have a way to reduce that, I think we have a responsibility as global citizens to, to avoid dumping those things. So architects, anybody tell me who this is? No way. Ham who said Hammurabi? Thank you. Yes, it is Hammurabi. Okay, now the question, why do I have a picture of Hammurabi here? He wrote the code for civil society. Yes, I for an I, tooth for two, you can say it. But, but he also wrote the first building code. Now, are there any builders in the room? Okay, I want your opinion on whether this is a good building code. It's a performance-based code. And you know, you can apply it to architects or engineers, because the builders back then were architects and engineers. So how many think that this is a good building code? Okay, how many of those people who put their hands up are building officials? Okay, how many of those people who put their hands up have kids? So this was the first building code. We, we've sort of come a long way uh, on building codes, and we're now including things that are have an environmental impact, whether it's life cycle analysis, whether it's carbon, whether it's net zero energy, whether it's reduced energy. These are happening around the world. It's not just uh, in our local community where we tend to focus all our, our attention, but it's happening around the world. And you'll hear uh, Francesca talk about LCA, um, she's got a PhD, I don't, so I'll just talk to give a couple of slides. But there's a, there's a movement everywhere to try to reduce the impacts of our operations. But it's also shifting to look at the embodied impacts. Uh, in Canada, we have carbon taxes. In Alberta, we have carbon cap and trade. In Ontario and Quebec, there's a, a new energy step code that is trying to advance the energy performance of our buildings. Um, and uh, even the city of Vancouver, which is sort of leading the way in British Columbia and in Canada, and in some cases, North America, has uh, brought in a policy which came into effect last May that all rezonings, Vancouver Affordable Housing Authority, and city projects must report embodied impacts. So um, uh, there are some folks from, I see Patrick Enright from the city of Vancouver here. This is something which is revolutionary uh, in North America. It is common in Europe but it's also a tremendous opportunity for wood. 
So I mentioned earlier sink, sequester, substitute, but I, I, I want to change that from the 3S concept to the 4S concept. You heard the, uh, the chief of the U.S. Forest Service talk about sustainability. And it really, if we're going to use wood, it needs to come from a sustainable, renewable source. So why are forests important? Um, this slide shows where areas of the world are, have a deforestation rate greater than half percent and areas of afforestation like China, which is planting more, more forests on land that wasn't forested than the rest of the world combined. Can anyone tell me the difference between deforestation and logging? Is there a difference? The back there? Those are the exact uh, analogies I use. It's areas that's not going to be a forest, it's going to be a parking lot, could be agriculture, could be urban development. So um, areas that, that are changed from forest use to another use are classified as deforestation. So in North America, we have, uh, the, the, I guess, more certified forests than um, the next 10 countries. Canada and the US uh, have more certified forests than the next 10 or 12 countries combined. So if we're buying wood from North American sources, we can be pretty, pretty confident that it's coming from a sustainable source. So back to this slide. Can anyone tell me what these peaks and valleys mean? What causes them? Any thoughts? Sorry? Seasons. Seasons. OK, so where is what season? Exactly. So I put it as winter in the northern season is the up. But what this shows is that forests do have a, an impact on our CO2 levels. So if we can create more forests, we're able to, re, uh, to have more uh, absorption of that CO2 and conversion into wood. So um, this may look like a complicated graph. It's really not. Forests will uh, start growing and they start accumulating carbon, but after a while they reach a stasis where they, there's as much death and decay as there is growth. Um, forest uh, trees are sort of like people. They start off small, they grow rapidly to a certain height, and then like me, they start getting big around the middle, and then they start to die off. So <laughs> it will come to all of you. So in a forest that has huge trees, you can count those trees. It may only be 100 per hectare or 40 per acre. Um, and, but a young forest might have three or 400 per acre. So there's lots of carbon in, in smaller trees, or there's a lot of carbon in bigger trees. But after a while, those forests cannot absorb any more CO2. When we harvest forests and then use that wood in long-lived materials, we're actually taking that CO2, which was, became sugar, which became cellulose, which became wood, and locking it up for a period of time. Different products have different uh, half-lives, if you will, and that's why the slope of uh, product sequestration is less than the slope, the uptake of, of carbon by the forest. But the big bang is actually in product substitution. If we're going to build, we have a choice. We can build it with something that is going to have some impact, but also some potential for uh, sequestration, or we can build something that's going to have emissions. So sink, sequester, substitute. Those are things that I'd like you to remember because they are ways that you, if you're an advocate for wood or you want to incorporate wood, that you can position when you're presenting your project to a local government, to a state, to a nation that has carbon commitments under the, uh, under the international agreements or has aspirations for reduced uh, embodied impacts like the city of Vancouver, and I think we'll see more of that. So, in fact, in 2007, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, recognized that growing more forest land, growing more trees on that forest land, and using more wood was the best mitigation strategy. Now, mitigation is, is not um, reducing. Mitigation is pulling back from the cliff, not slowing down as we, as we approach the edge. So we want to mitigate climate change, not just slow down our, our increase in CO2. So and this is where um, having an understanding of what is the impact of what we choose to build is going to make a difference. So I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware of the, the positive benefits of LCA towards making decisions around materials from a, a total energy use, greenhouse gas, air pollution, uh, a number of different areas. 
Um, <clears throat> but there's another area that I think we, we need to, to look at. This is an LCA that was done on a, a series of buildings in Australia. And what they looked at is what is the embodied carbon of the life of the building, not just the, the structure itself or its operations. And you can see that we've got the materials, materials transferred, all the things that go into building the building total, in this case, about 35% of the embodied impact of that building. And then look over at air conditioning and, and cooling. That is the part of the building that is regulated by building codes. Building codes don't tell you how often you turn on your light or your stereo or how cold you keep your food in the fridge. But the other things, the hot water, the assembly maintenance and, and other operational energy, those are not governed by our building codes. The building codes focus on the, uh, on the operational performance of the building envelope. And when you look at th uh, this, which is only for Australia, the embodied impact of the envelope before you even start using the building is greater than the operational uh, impacts that is governed by our building code. So LCA needs to, to transition from being a post-construction damage assessment tool to being a pre-design valuation tool. Not so much to say this is the system and the material and the, that we're going to use, but to guide us to say, oh, I didn't realize that this kind of system has a much lower impact. There's a tool that's being developed in, in the province of Quebec that is looking at typical assemblies. There's there's you know, dozens of different ways to build floors or walls or columns or beams or roofs, depending on the building, on the code, the function of the building, the load capacity. So what they're doing is they're taking these systems, and I think they've got about 95 or 96 percent of the typical construction systems, and looking at the life cycle impact of, say, a 36 square meter floor space or X lineal feet of wall or column or beam that carries a certain function, does a certain uh, function. So for example, in a typical steel concrete decking, you've got open web steel truss, you've got decking, you've got rebar, you've got concrete. Each of those has an impact um, by quantity or mass of materials. So the total for that assembly uh, in the beta version of this tool was 1,633 kilograms of steel. performs the same job and could be built under the code in the same type of building. This wouldn't apply to a, you know, a 30 story building yet. So the same function is performed by the same area of wood. It's got wood, lumber, panels, nails, plates, 276 kilograms of CO2E per the same section doing the same job versus 1633. Now does that mean that this system should be used always? No. Because you're going to, you have different requirements, different demands on load, um, uh, on sizing. But what this does is it sort of alerts people to, hmm, maybe we should go down this kind of material path, whether it's a composite, whether it's a hybrid, whether it is uh, an all material. So it, it's, it's trying to alert people to the potential to think differently about what we make our buildings with. So. Um, how many of you played Pac-Man when you were younger? Anyone who has gray hair, if you, if you didn't, you're lying. <clears throat> so um, over the life of a building, we have the embodied impact, which is between 12 and 15, per, 12 and 20 percent. I chose it at 15 because that's easier to multiply uh, for a biologist than other things. Um, and there's the operational impact and the embodied. But at year one or year zero, here are your keys, turn on the first lights, turn on the heat. 100% of the impact of that building is embodied. It's done. You cannot change that. Those impacts have been made and they're not going to change. Over time, you start accumulating operational impact. So on an 80-year lifespan for a building with a 15% embodied impact, at year 12, your operational and your embodied have met. They're, they're about the same. After that, your operational impact increases. So at the end of 80 years, this is about th the ratio for a typical building. But what could possibly go wrong? What happens if I don't take care of my building? What happens if I have a really good operator and his, his operational efficiency is such that we reduce that operational impact? I get bored with the building or 
I get, someone says, oh, by the way, that lot that you paid 300,000 for is now worth 17 million. Can we build a building there? It's gone after 30 years. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that can affect the actual longevity of that building that we can't predict when we build the building. What we can predict is <clears throat> can we, uh, our ability to reduce the embodied impact of a building. So um, put it in a simple graph. When you build a building, you have the embodied impact, and then you accumulate the operational impact. Uh, and different materials or different systems are going to have different embodied impacts. But they all have an embodied impact. That's our true zero point when we're looking at post-construction operational. But we've already made that impact. We can design buildings to different levels of performance, which lowers the angle of our operational. And there's going to be a crossover point where the embodied and the operational um, benefits uh, meet. We don't know exactly where that's going to be and how efficient our building is. And we can't predict when it would be more critical. What happens if our, if our um, uh, parts per million concentration of CO2 is 450 or 500 or 475? We don't know that. So we have to pay attention to the embodied impact because we don't know what benefits or what impacts are going to occur over what time frame. So it's just something to think about that the embodied impact and our increased uh, environmental performance or operational performance are working to mean that we need to focus a little bit more on how and what we build the building with, not just how well we build the operational performance. So <clears throat> um, the other thing is, this is some research out of uh, um, uh, Montreal. Um, uh, I've got all the, the papers, and if you have, suffer insomnia, please let me know. They're, 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 they've got lots of lowercase Greek letters, which I never had to use in university. But um, it shows a couple of things. It shows here that the Im impact of our emissions are greatest in the first you know, 70 to 80 years of after the impact. It also shows that they actually never really disappear. It, 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 they disappear by going into the ocean, going into, into our, our flora. Um, so we have to recognize that anything we put out there, probably in 1,000 years, is still 30%, 40% of it remaining. But the impact is cumulative. So the first, the large steep slope, <clears throat> which increases um, the, the, the concentration, that's when the most impact is. And then, then gradually it levels off. Further, it, it demonstrates the importance of embodied impacts being considered not just operational. So how many of you have a retirement plan? Good. I asked a group of architects in Vancouver a couple weeks ago, and three guys stuck up their hand. <clears throat> so um, and if you look at uh, carbon impact like a retirement plan, you can do it two ways. You can say, well, I'm going to try to avoid these emissions early on in the life of the building, and I'll accumulate the benefit. Or, and the similar to a retirement plan, is I'll put in 75 bucks a month, and at the end, when I'm 65, I've got a lump to, to, uh, uh, to retire on. Or you can say, I'm just going to wait till I'm 65 and I'm going to put $700,000 in my retirement plan and call it a day. <clears throat> well, that's wishful thinking for, for most of us. But what this is showing is that if we start now and recognize the embodied impacts of our buildings, we're accumulating a benefit so that in 80 years, we don't have to save four tons. So saving a ton of carbon today, be it operational or, or sequestered or avoided, means we don't have to save four tons in 80 years. Anybody have any question on that? So uh, the next area that we can really save on carbon is the energy performance. This is a passive house multifamily building in Vancouver. It was opened, what, about a month ago, Patrick? Um, it is a uh, uh, light frame. Uh, it's got a, an interior wall of 2 by 4 and an exterior wall of 2 by 6. So the perimeter walls have 65%, 66% more wood than a conventional mid-rise construction. The structural elements are basically inside, but the exterior wall has 60, 65% more wood. It has, uh, for heating and cooling, it's modeled to have a 91% energy saving. It also has about a 70% energy saving for operations. So total, it's going to be about an 80 
75 to 80 percent lower energy use in this building. There was a Passive House conference in Vancouver and there's a woman from Central uh, uh, Center for Climate Change and Sustainable Energy at Central European University. <clears throat> she was a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and they were tasked with finding the fastest, the best, and the cheapest way to reduce global energy use. Well, since about 40 to 50 percent of our energy use is from buildings, they started looking at that operational performance. And their conclusion was the fastest, the best, and the cheapest way to reduce global energy use, and one big lump sum is to build and retrofit all buildings to a passive level performance. So it, it can be done, but it takes uh, individual and uh, political will and a commitment that there's some value to spending that incremental money. <clears throat> so this is another one that is uh, also being built in Vancouver by the same architect. The city of Vancouver has recognized that, hey, this fulfills a lot of our aspirations. So if you've got a, a jurisdiction that is hoping to find for, in, to look for down the road for carbon or energy savings, this kind of building, you must position it in, in the context of what your, your, your jurisdiction is hoping to achieve. So back to my Pac-Man. When you build a uh, <clears throat> typical building, I chose 15%. But there's usually about a 15% boost in a materials that go into a passive building. So that's been accommodated for there. There's a, a corresponding reduction in energy use. And let's go through our drawing here. So year five, year 30, 60, year 80. So after the same time period, that's where the Pac-Man still not able to eat the pie. When you can look, when you consider the co comparison between conventional code, which is this large circle, total impact after 80 years, and the passive house level performance, the embodied impact is still greater than the operational but the total is about one-third of a conventional code building, embodied and operational. Now, why is all this stuff relevant to Mass Timber Conference? <clears throat> okay, this is a Mass Timber project that has been approved in, on Vancouver Island. It's pending a, a, a it's called a special, um, a site-specific site regulation um, put out by the minister because our codes don't allow 12-story buildings made out of wood. <clears throat> but they were so impressed with this, it's designed to passive level performance, mass timber, tall wood. Sort of the, the, the three sort of hot buttons, which I think are of interest to people at this conference. After 100 years, it's still carbon negative. And that comes from three things. First, it's got a net sequestration benefit of 2,600 metric tons of CO2 locked up in the wood. It was actually 2,900, but it took 300 metric tons to produce that wood. So they've netted out the emissions associated with that. It's using 70 to 80 percent less total energy use. And we're lucky in British Columbia because 97 percent of our energy is carbon free. It's mostly hydro, which is, uh, I guess, a testament to the fact that we need to have renewable energy. So how many buildings can be carbon negative after 100 years? When the architect called me to go over these numbers, he said, this, this doesn't make any sense. So we went through, and, said, and it, is, it is true. And then he turned to me and said, if this is true, why doesn't everybody build this way? And they just, because they don't know how, and they don't know they can. So the carbon considerations I really would like you to, to think about when you're positioning your building to, to the regulatory bodies. Sink, sequester, substitute, sustainable forestry as well. Remember the importance of time. Time heals all wounds, but it also accumulates all impact or benefit. So we need to consider that time is important when we're evaluating total embodied impact. And build the best quality operational building you can, because that performance is directly impacting carbon from your energy source. So I often get asked why we should build with wood. <clears throat> and I was at a, a show, there was a 14 foot table about four feet wide, one piece of wood. And a little old lady about my mom's age came up and said, uh, I really don't think we should be cutting down trees. And because she was like my mom, I had to be polite. I said, well, I understand that. I said, what are you going to build with? Well, there's plastic and there's glass. I've seen some beautiful aluminum tables and tiles. Again, I had to be polite. But I said, as soon as someone invents a material 
It is renewable, reusable, recyclable, organic, biodegradable, cleans the air, cleans the water, sequesters carbon, produces oxygen, gives us a material that's strong, lightweight, easy to use, beautiful, diverse, and cheap, and ubiquitous. I'm going to stick with wood. And if they do invent that, please let me know because I'd like to invest in it. But the question really shouldn't be, why wood? But if not wood, what? If we're going to continue to build, and we can build with wood, and we don't, are we really building the best building we can? There's no perfect building material, but if you are a designer or a builder and you don't understand how to build with wood, it's like being a chef who doesn't know how to use, use vegetables. So build out your repertoire, understand, and I think that's why you're in the room. We have the opportunity. Let's not, let's not blow it. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.